and we are glad that you're here with us in this space as we gather together to read some scripture uh, where we find God's word, to sing songs of our faith, to give witness to the work of God in our life. We believe here at university that our call is to build bridges. We like to connect things, so we're going to build bridges between Christ and people who need that encounter, between Christ and compassion, and uh, between bridges between us and the community that the, the church is called to be about. We invite you to be a part of that. We believe the encounter with God in this space sends us from this place to a different life than we entered with. We invite you to, to sing along uh, to the songs, to and worship with us, uh, to find in your bulletin sort of things that are going on in the life of the church. The side tears off. Uh, so if you want to tear that off and drop that in the plate here in a bit, you can let us know how we can be praying for you. Let us know if you change your address or contact information. Anything you want us to be aware of, you can uh, use that sheet of paper to uh, do just that. Um, we're glad that you're with us and invite you to uh, offer your voice as we stand together now and sing God of grace and God of glory. It's hymn 577. I don't know if it's happening in this service, but I know it's happening at 8.15. I've been making a few comments about how you sometimes sit in the signed pews. What I didn't realize is how much stability it gave me knowing where people were going to be. They're moving around now <laughs> at 8.15, and it's very disorienting for me. Maybe you're doing it as well, which would mean good news. There's new people for you to greet this morning all around you 
reach out with your hand and say good morning to them. Uh, welcome them here in the peace and love of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. May we continue in a disposition of prayer together. Our God of rest and of strength, of hope and of beauty, we come before you in this hour to sing songs to the things that you have done that remind us of who you are. As we celebrate that in this place, may we be sent with that truth to share. We lift before you in this hour those of our number who are grieving, who in heart ache, in life are in pain, those whose bodies or their minds are breaking down or betraying their instructions. Lord, we lift before them, before you, them, that your peace and your power might reign. We lift before you all those who love those who hurt that your healing might come and restore the hearts, the hopes, and the homes. 
Lord, that before you, our community, the schools that we send our kids to, the places that we work, the streets that we drive, the dirt that we till, the lives that we lead, that we might catch a glimpse of your work and your will among us. And so, Lord, we seek you, that you might free us from all those things of the past that have captured us that are not your grace, that bind us that aren't your blessings that consume us that aren't your purpose, that we might be restored to the fullness and abundance of life for which you have built us, designed us, and call us, that the world indeed might be filled with the good news of your grace. We pray this with boldness and confidence, knowing that it is only possible through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns and has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. They remain seated as we sing our hymn of preparation, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. It's hymn 365. We're going to do verses 1 and 4. Amen. On the front of your bulletin, there's a great picture of one of our small groups here at university. This is the Senior High Girls uh, Life Group. Uh, you can see that group. They've been together for a while, uh, as seniors are wont to do. Started years ago, I think as freshmen together. Um, they may have been a junior high group together, but I know But since high school they've been together. Added members, folks have moved, but they've come together. They would tell you to a person they're different. They're changed by the encounter of each other in a space that's safe that they might share the truth about their lives, might be challenged in their lives. Uh, It is in these spaces that transformation of heart and life takes place. Wesley called them class meetings, even smaller groups called band meetings. This is uh, what is happening in our student ministry group, and you can take courage and confidence uh, that your investment in the ministry and mission of this place makes this possible. And this will change the world forever, not just for them, but for all the people that they will meet and bless as we go. If you've not met some of the amazing young people uh, that are products of this place, uh, I highly encourage you to come Wednesday night and have dinner and meet some of these folks uh, who are an absolute blessing both in this moment and will be for the future. The ushers are going to come forward and they're going to invite us to be courageous and bold in our giving. I know many of you have regular giving that you do online. I want you to pray about that as the plate goes by. Drop in uh, the bulletin if you need to, if you need something to drop in. I know uh, you don't want to be empty handed. I know you invest in many of ways. We have uh, lots of ways in which that happens. But this is a moment of worship where we set it aside to say what happens here is only possible when God's grace makes us generous people. 
that we might be changed and transformed of heart and life. And so let's pray. Lord, pour out your presence upon us here and now that we who give might be uh, aware of our great stewardship of all that you've given us. Uh, Lord, make us generous and bold and joyful in this hour, knowing that you take whatever it is that we can do, break, bless, and multiply, that it might be sent into the world to bring good news to all. And Lord, for all those in this hour who are anxious about their financial life, about the accounts, about their bills, may your peace, your power, and your possibility reign in their hearts and open the fields for them that they might labor with fruitfulness and faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. I mentioned last Sunday that I was, well, unwatched. Holly had taken the kids and headed to her sisters and family, and they had a, a great time. They were gone for uh, four days. That's right. So Monday, the weather was fantastic, and uh, I fired up the grill. I'm going to make some smoke happen in the backyard. And so I went to the drawer. There's not many places in my home, I can confess, that really belong to me. <laughs> the soft but non-aggressive laughing of some spouses in the room. I got you. Ha <laughs> ha, easy. But the drawer with the grilling instrumentation is pretty much my realm in the kitchen universe. And so I go to that drawer with every confidence, and I open the drawer, and I reach in that drawer, and I guess I wasn't as focused as I normally would be in reaching into a strange drawer because this is my drawer. And I felt a pinch on the end of my finger. I recoiled from the pinch, sliding my finger down a very sharp blade. Yes. I love the visceral reaction, people who are experiencing this with me. You're my favorites. Looked down at my finger, the tip of it. Already announcing that I had sliced myself and bleeding, I looked down at this instrument of torture and death in the grilling drawer. It's white, it has like a guillotine looking thing going on. I think it's for giving carrots haircuts. I don't know <laughs> what it's for or what it's doing in my grilling drawer. So I go over to the sink and I run water on it, you know, that cold water thing, and kind of look at it, and like, how bad is it? Uh, you know, sort of it bleeds for a while, we have pepper tail around it, and I'm like, okay, I'm done with this. I'm really over it. You know, I don't really want to deal with it any longer. So I wrap it up, kind of tape up the paper towel, and uh, go on. I, I would look down, and the paper towel, I'd bleed through, and I, I would, I started to sort of like have a conversation with my finger, like, I've got other things to do. Would you stop? And I kind of hold it up, like, let's drain this out of blood, let's quit that which I know the medical people say is really what you're supposed to do, that this is the thing that heals it. Waving backwards. Um, and I, so I'm telling it to stop doing this and um, arguing with the finger, it continues to bleed. And then it would stop for a while, but then I would forget that I had cut it. And then, I don't know if you know this, maybe you are aware of this, I didn't realize how often I use my middle finger. I know that doesn't sound very pastoral, What I mean is, like when you grab things, the tip of your finger, which seems sort of innocuous to have a wound on it, it just kept opening back up for several days. It wouldn't stay closed. Um, and I, I, it was fine if I stopped using it, but I have sort of a habit of using my hands. Holly returned home. I wanted to have a conversation with her about this device of torture that was in my drawer. And she said, well, that's the mandolin. And I said, no, a mandolin is in folk music and I like it. <laughs> I don't know what this thing is, but it doesn't belong in this drawer. And this is what happened. And I realized that a grown man showing another person his small, very, at that point, mostly healed cut, seems unimportant. But I showed her, told her it was her fault. In Lent, we've been looking at spiritual disciplines, and discipline's a word that we don't necessarily love because sometimes we get the burden and the challenge before we get the creativity and goodness and blessing. This was true all the way back five weeks ago in uh, the beginning of Lent, we talked about prayer. Sometimes it feels awkward and strange, and, and how do we do that? So we explore this invitation of a discipline that invites us both to speak and to not speak, to listen uh, and to express ourselves and to draw nearer to the heart of God. A week later, we talk about fasting. There's one that really brings the burden before it brings the blessing and saying no to things like food, basic good things, but the pattern of which breaking that pattern can often open up spiritual uh, growth and truth in our lives. We talk about starting small and growing our capacity to say no, that we might say yes 
to the greater things of our lives. Not that those things were bad, but that those patterns and habits are easy to believe that they have the power over us and fasting is the spiritual discipline that invites us to freedom, even in those places of our need. And then we looked at study a few weeks ago, and study invited us not only to study of Scripture, that we might have the Word of God become a part of our very bones and body. We talked about studying that not we accumulate knowledge, but that our knowledge might be converted in us as wisdom, that our minds might be transformed and we might know the will and work of God in our lives and in the world, but our own experiences to reflect on those and the things that happen, to think about those, dedicate mental space to turn our experiences into wisdom as well is part of the discipline of study. And then last week we talked about silence and solitude, whether in the chaos of an ongoing day or getting away into nature and having some space uh, to take a deep breath of the quiet and the rest and hearing that still small voice from God in those spaces. Uh, This week we turn to 1 John, the letter of 1 John, uh, and the first chapter. Now, uh, lots of good things I hope happen for us in this worship service, one of which is we're going to do a whole chapter of the Bible, which you can really impress your Episcopalian and Baptist friends at lunch today, that you did a whole chapter of the Bible and it didn't even hurt. Listen up. Word of God, chapter 1, verse 1 of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we've heard and what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So it's very personal. This is the preamble, the first few verses, introduction to this letter. We know this, we've touched this, we've been with this. This is the word of life. We want to testify to this. This is what we tell you about. This life was revealed and we have seen it and we testify to it and declare it to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. That life and life abundant, life forever, was let loose from heaven by the Father on the Son and we walked around and shared life with it and saw it victorious. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. That our relationship might be something new and truly our fellowships with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So what follows is an invitation for a restoration of relationship for us with God that the joy not only of us but of all might be complete. And this is the message, verse 5. We have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So this light-darkness dichotomy um, is an invitation to see that God's holiness and otherness, um, words that sort of seem distant to us at times, but what they mean is not broken, not toxic, not corrosive, not painful, not exploitive, not oppressive, all the things that we breathe in every day. All the things that you and I in life are encountered by. God is not, it's not in him, it's not of him. These corrosive aspects of the world and of our life, of society, and even of our own lives are not of God. In him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. That is, the pattern of our lives don't match the purpose of our words. We say we're in the light, we say we're chasing after God's good thing, we're, we're gospel people, we're good news people, but there's no good news. There's no response, there's the same life, and John says it shouldn't look that way. But if we walk in light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. There's that restoration, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We are restored, and Jesus does the restoring, both together and with God. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Here ends the reading, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. His word is not in us. John, the gospel uh, is built around this theme that the word would be made flesh. The word was made flesh in Jesus, that it might be made flesh in those who follow him. And if we say we have no failings, no faults, no sins, no shortcomings, no missed good we could have done, 1 John says pretty boldly, 
then the truth and that word are not residing in our flesh, at least not in totality. This is an ancient problem for us as people. The spiritual discipline of confession, that we might tell the truth about the state of our lives, our hearts, and our past, that our futures might be different. If we go to the beginning of the story, we see one of the challenges of this early on. Adam and Eve are in the garden. Everything's great. God wants to be with them. God uh, says, take care of each other. Take care of the dirt. Meet with me in the afternoon. God desires that not one beautiful thing be marred and broken, including you. God desires that not one creative endeavor be futile and frustrated, God's desire and design is not that it would hurt and be hard and be frustrating in this life, and yet it is. He says, uh, be fruitful and multiply and have goodness and mercy. And Adam and Eve, we have that scene, the serpent comes and Eve takes the fruit from the tree, that the one rule God gives them, don't do this, let me be in charge of what's right and what's wrong, what's light and what's dark takes the fruit, eats it, gives it to her husband, Adam, who's with her the whole time and says nothing during the whole debate with the serpent. And the beginning of the fall of a world that you and I live in that's different than that design and desire of God is the one in which they realize there's something wrong with them. Instantly, they're filled with shame, they're alienated from their very bodies, and they want to get away and hide. First John says, if you don't know the truth about yourself, then God hasn't finished working in you. In the beginning, we see the human beings falling away from each other by being alienated from themselves. Then they're alienated from each other, and then God shows up and says, hey, I want to hang out. Where are you? And they said, we hid because we are naked and ashamed. And God says, what have you been doing? And I did, maybe it's the parenting side of me, but I, I want to think God's face was something like this. I gave you one rule, not 10, not 20, one. Work with me, people. One rule. All I said is let's do it this way and it'll be great. What happened? Have you been eating the fruit I told you not to eat? And Eve said, well, the serpent, yeah, the serpent tricked me and I ate it. And then this is the kicker. Adam. Adam. That woman Direct translation, that woman that you put in here with me gave it to me and I ate. So I really shouldn't be held responsible, Lord. I mean, if you think about it, God, it's your fault. The first problem with our brokenness and confession is admitting that we have a problem in the first place, being vulnerable enough to admit we've been hurt and we hurt each other. The second is we go trying to heal ourselves in ways that aren't effective, and that is through blame. Whether it's the fruit in the garden or the mandolin in the drawer. We want to blame somebody else because we've been hurt. Now, sometimes it's somebody else have done it to us and we've been wounded. But most of the time, the wounds that linger in our hearts and our lives are oftentimes repeated in our own journeys by us. And yet we blame other people for our journey and it is doesn't heal us. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't heal us. What does heal us, First John says, is the blood of Jesus. And that sounds strange to modern ears. How can the blood of Jesus possibly heal and restore parts of my past and my heart and my life that aren't right? The first thing we have to do is admit that the parts of our past and our heart and our life are wrong. And that requires us to be vulnerable and humble. These are not the modern world's favorite things to do. Vulnerability and humility are not what we're trained to do. And yet, pretending we're not wounded doesn't heal us. I tried it with my finger. And, and it kind of works so long as you don't want to actually use it. So if you're not thinking of using your heart or using your life, then you're probably fine pretending you're not wounded. But the moment you try to use your emotions, you try to use your thinking, you try to use your life, those wounds open right back up. 
and the pain and hurt therein from our sin and our falling short, from the sin and falling short of other people in our stories, our parents, our grandparents, whoever hurt you, all those things, those wounds open right back up and over time unaddressed the infection of cynicism and apathy and corrosion of life digs in there and the wound that was small before is now bigger. Healing comes not when we pretend we haven't been wounded, but when we address the wound as it truly is so that we can use the thing that's been hurt, our heart, our life, our purposes, our passions, our thoughts. And confession is the healing treatment for the wounds of our life. Sin, mistakes, brokenness, confessed, open us and name the wounds. And then we watch as the grace of God makes our wounds into scars. And our scars become the stories of grace at work in our life. And we have to find a way to tell our scar stories. For our wounds, we take them to a place that's safe. We should take them to a group, whether it's, if you're in this group, they can take their wounds and talk about them with each other, their failings and their failures, their frustrations and their fears, because they're in a place that's protected. Uh, Wesley called them class meetings or bands. If you're a Emmaus person, reunion groups that function the best are these places where you can tell the truth. Maybe it's prayer partners. Uh, I don't know what that looks like for you. Some group, some small group generally, that can hear you tell the truth about your life and love you anyway because we're all just a little bit or a lot of bit afraid that if people around us really knew, if they genuinely knew us, they wouldn't like or love us. That's why we pretend. That's why we aren't vulnerable. That's why we walk around wounded because we will not allow the truth to set us free. So wounds get taken to containers of accountability, containers of love and trust, where people share together, bless together, pray together, because the fellowship, John says, that happens when light pours into dark places has restorative community aspects, and people grow closer to God and closer to each other. Once those wounds have been healed, though, those become public possibilities. And I say this because, now, there may be uh, folks here that are uh, visiting with us at 9.30 that have wandered in here and wonder. And one of the things I hear people tell me that they wonder about when they visit a church is, are these people for real? Are the folks I'm sitting around, are they, 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 are they really real people? Or are they something different than me? And if you've been in church your whole life, if you grew up and you, you were raised by faithful people, that's a huge blessing. But it often makes it hard to understand the lives of those who didn't live that way. Who sit next to you in the pew right now and believe that you, church-going person, have all the answers. You know all the books of the Bible, chapter and verse. Now, that your life really hasn't been a struggle and you're here because things have really been victory to victory to victory for you. Now, I know all of you, so I know you better than that but they don't. There are those among us that don't, and we wonder, am I the only one with a past that has been a problem, with habits that are a struggle? Am I the only one who has real problems? And the freeing and powerful work of confession is for us to tell the story of how God has healed our wounds. That's always what's made us compelling. Not the pretense of our piety, but the reality of the work that God has done in our life. This is what makes us compelling in the world. Always has, always will be. It is not our dominance, but our dependence upon God's grace that tells the truth that we too have struggled, been frustrated, we have failed and fallen short, and yet we found in this story, in the blood of Jesus even, the power to be made new and healed. And these used to be open wounds, this story of my life, and now they're scars to tell the story of the healing that God has worked in my life. And it wasn't blaming that saved me. It wasn't pretending I wasn't hurt. It wasn't pretending I haven't sinned. It was in fact telling the truth and turning to others and having them tell the truth to me as well. In that community of healing, lives are transformed. Now this is a discipline like all the others that at first blush or first encounter can pinch a little bit. Like the cleansing treatments that come to a cut when you pour the stuff you're supposed to pour in it and you actually put a bandage on it 
or stitch it up if it needs that. Those don't feel great at first, and yet it lead to healing. So too does confessing what has happened and how we've been wounded in our own life and how we've wounded others set us free. Now, we can do that with just God. I believe that deeply. The altar will be open later. If you've got something you need to lay down at the altar, we're going to sing a great hymn in honor of Billy Graham, who uh, has recently gone on to his uh, reward, um, Just As I Am Without One Plea. And when we sing that song, if you want to come pray and lay something down, come lay it down. You can individually do that. But I will tell you, over time, it is very helpful to have community members that you trust to help you remember the victory of your scars and remember the reality of your need for grace and to encourage you to live your giftedness and blessing for others. This happens not necessarily in rooms full of 500 people, but in much smaller gatherings that I would encourage you to seek out. If you do not have that group, I invite you to pray that God would reveal it to you because I guarantee he's faithful to that request. If in that process you want the church to be a part of helping facilitate that and put some folks together, we can do that. But many times these things happen best when they're organically born of a desired heart to be healed and made well to share the journey together. Because the blood of Jesus and the wounds of Good Friday are our hope. This isn't just a psychological therapy that we go through. This doesn't make us feel better of what we've been through. This is actually, I believe, the cosmic pivot on which all else turns. That is, we are two weeks away from Good Friday where we'll stare at the cross and see this wounded Savior for us, the blood of Jesus, John mentions, poured out for us. Because in the end, one of two things will determine our lives and our destiny. That is, either the course of our life will be defined by our wounds or by the wounds of Jesus. It'll be our wounds and the infections they wrought or the healing power and presence of a God who shows up and is wounded for our sake that every wound can become a scar, every story can be redeemed, every love can be healed, and every one can belong. This is why Friday on a cross with blood is good news. It's Good Friday. Not because crosses are good, not because Roman oppression and intimidation by foreign powers is good, not because trumped up pretense of religious authorities in partnership with those powers who put Jesus on that cross are good, they're not. The whole point is, here see all the powers, evil at work, and yet, God's goodness and mercy in the ugliness flips it and makes beautiful. In the broken brings blessing. In the pain brings the possibility of his presence poured out for you and for me. And it is in confession that we say, yep, I see it, I hear it. I too now give testimony to it. This is the witness, John says, that love has been made flesh for us. We have touched it, we have seen it, we have heard it. And so we tell you this is who we are. May it also be your story that you might be in fellowship with us, he says, and that we might grow in our fellowship with the Father for Jesus is the word made flesh for you and for me. May those words take on flesh in our life that we might speak them in truth. And when we leave this place, and encounter people who wonder, who ache, who know in this world the wounds that come so easily, so readily, that there is healing and there is hope because we have seen it, we have touched it, we've experienced it, and we testify to it in word and deed. And we can't do that by pretending that sin has not been in us, that darkness has not chased us as well, that darkness has not been near to us in parts of our lives or even now, and yet the light of God has poured into us in such a way as to set us free from bondage to decay and death. This is our prayer, our hope, and our only power in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we... Uh, are so used to pretending that we've got it together and we're 
at least faking it that we've got it perfected. But the truth is all of us struggle. All of us have known failings and faults. May we find voice to that truth in spaces that are safe, particularly where those truths are hard. And then collectively, may our witness be tinged with that honesty about the wounds you've turned into scars by your grace, by your willingness to take upon your wounds all that hurts, all that's hard, all that's death, all that's ugly in this world before, now, and forever. So, Lord, as we sing this song, anyone, Lord, that needs to lay down before you things that sin, that cling so close to your heart, may they be honest at least to start for themselves and with you that your cleansing light might pour out upon us and all unrighteousness might be wiped away, that we would leave here not perfect people, but empowered by your grace, called by your purpose, and healed by your witness and your work in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. There are several ways for you to respond to what God's doing in our community and in your life today, Uh, one of which is to pray about a space in which you can tell the truth about your own vulnerability and humility that's safe for you. If you have that, you already know that confession is a huge blessing. If you don't, let's pray, and I'll join you in that prayer and you finding it, that that can happen in your life as well. You're also invited to pray uh, for other folks here at the card table to my left. You can come talk to me uh, and I can pray over you or we can celebrate that today's the day you wanna say yes to the offer that God makes to you in Jesus. Uh, We can celebrate that you're restored to the community and the joy might indeed be complete among us as you become part of our family. You can join this church today. Say yes to Jesus and join the family of God today. In your bulletin, it mentions it. In the atrium, there's a table. There's also a chance for you to be part of World Vision's 6K. I double checked. Apparently is a 6K. It seems like one more K than I would need. But they're going, and I want to say they're going the extra mile, but like a kilometer is not that long. So uh, they're going the extra like what? Like a quarter mile. Like that's, uh, so six kilometers is the race. Uh, world Vision is for water. Uh, in the developing world, you can run if fun and run go together for you. Uh, or you can sponsor those who are uh, willing to do it. Um, and invest in clean water happening in communities uh, where that is a desperate need. So go by the table and find out about our World Vision team. There's a university group that's running uh, this year in Breckenridge Park. You can join them. Uh, You can also uh, be a part of Holy Week here at university. Uh, So Palm Sunday is coming, and right after Palm Sunday, a week from now, Holy Week will begin. On Wednesday, we will have our family Wednesday night dinner. Everybody's welcome at that. Uh, Come on out and eat. We will not have uh, the pastoral Bible study at 16, but there will be a new study in John Wesley uh, on growing as a couple. Uh, You can check that out. I think there's a slide on, well, we're doing this. Let's do this first. Palm Sunday, we have uh, all the services. 9, 30, and 11 will be the procession with palms, not at 8, 15. Uh, Monday, Thursday is our communion uh, and uh, Passover uh, celebration that Jesus institutes before he is betrayed. And so Thursday night's focused on that in the worship center on the north side uh, at 6.30. At 6.30 in here in the sanctuary, we're having our Good Friday observances and service. Uh, when we talk about this amazing love of God poured out upon uh, the cross for us and for all. On Saturday, we're having a family interactive children's experience. Last year, there was a donkey. I'm ter- told the donkey will be back. Um, uh, that's worth the trip right there. A lot of activities and lessons. It's a great family friendly and really families of all ages. If you think, well, I don't have a, a seven year old, this isn't for me. Anybody who would like to have an encounter with a unique way to celebrate Easter on that Saturday will be blessed to be a part of that. That's at 3 p.m. On, in the worship center on the north side. And then on Easter Sunday morning, 7 a.m. sunrise service under uh, on the north side. Uh, excited about that. The students are leading that. We're very excited about uh, that worshiping uh, time. And then our service is 8.15, 9.30 and 11, 9.30 and 11 on the north uh, for you and your family to be a part of uh, the resurrection celebration on Easter. Um, We are uh, excited about what God is doing in this place. Uh, We pray that you will be prepared for the entirety of the journey through the meal given to remember, through the cross that we might be healed, and Easter morning where the victory uh, is celebrated uh, even over death in Jesus the Christ. We're going to sing our final song together. As I mentioned, it's Just As I Am. We're not going to do verses until, you know, everybody gives up and comes down. 
You've been to those, yeah. I, some of you grew up there, I got you. Uh, we're gonna do verses one, two, five, and six, but I will tell you the altar is open. If you wanna come up here and pray and lay something down, if you have something you wanna confess and be unburdened by, God is faithful and forgiving in that encounter. If you wanna say yes to Jesus and yes to this church, I'll be right down here as we stand together and saying, just as I am without one plea, hymn 357. A seat for just a moment. I want you guys to see some folks. Come on up. This is the uh, Stolhanskys. This is Charlie, and Charlie's 11 weeks old, and he's got this awesome thing where like the meat starts to curl in his ankle. Oh, that's the good stuff. The little crease meat. Oh man, that's at 11 weeks. It's super cute. I know it changes, but. Uh, we're very excited about Charlie. Elon, his older sister, is three, and she's in Sunday school, and they come uh, to transfer their membership. They've been at Coker UMC, and so we're celebrating uh, that they're here. We ask them, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as Lord? Do you commit yourself, now that you can see them kind of in the lights here, do you commit yourself to these people to be the family of God together to build bridges to Christ's community and compassion? All right, then they're home. Would you uh, receive them in love and grace by both reaffirming your commitment to Jesus Christ and rejection of sin? Say we do. We do all in their power as 11 weeks become 11 years, um, as they grow in the grace of Jesus Christ to love them, support them, and to provide a community and a container in which they can tell the truth about their lives and grow in grace. Will we be that church? Say we will. Then it is official and you are home. Would you rise and receive this benediction? You can welcome them with applause if you'd like. Elizabeth is going to connect with you. Elizabeth's right here. She'll lead you out. Make sure you shake their hand and welcome them to the family. We're delighted that you guys are here. Thanks so much. We got the acolytes going to lead us out. She had to do solo today, but you did a great job acolyting. You're a pro. Yeah, that's right. They're impressed with your acolyting skills. You're sent from this place into a world that's been lied to and hurt, broken and burdened. May we give witness to what we have seen, what we have heard, what we've encountered, that good news and good things might be multiplied and healing and hope and love might be restored to every human heart that's open to it. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.